I think people are starting to realize that they're like walking through their lives creating this huge data set of their own life. And it would be really helpful if they could leverage that, even in very small ways, you know, for their own well being. If you've ever wanted to be able to record your decisions more easily throughout the day, then you're not alone. Whether it's food or movement choices, or maybe just how much exercise you're getting, keeping track of what you're up to isn't that easy. It takes time to record each little detail. You can record things in a journal or on your phone, but putting everything together and analyzing it is a challenge. Plus, how do you ensure that your recordings remain private? In today's episode of Hidden in Plain Sight, we talk with Jordan Bonds. Jordan is tackling this immense problem with a company that she co-founded called Tally Labs. Tally Labs is a company that makes it easy to securely track what you want, when you want. In today's episode, we talk about the origins of the company and why ethics, security, and privacy are of the utmost importance as we explore the future of quantification. Enjoy. This season of Hidden in Plain Sight is brought to you exclusively by our friends at Splunk, the data to everything platform. Splunk helps organizations worldwide turn data into doing. It's time for data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen. Learn more at splunk.com or by clicking the link in our show notes. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. So you're the founder of Tally Lab and pretend we just met socially distanced, of course, of course, in Boston. And we're talking a little bit and you're telling me about what you do. How do you usually introduce yourself and your work? I usually introduce myself as the co-founder and CEO of Tally Lab. And I usually describe Tally Lab as an everything tracker for consumers and an everything tracker maker for businesses. Very cool. And then I usually see how that goes over. <laughs> <laughs> The decision trees branch out. Exactly, you can see exactly. All the different ways to take it. Right. Um, so just imagine that I know nothing about that. I think it sounds really cool. I know a little bit about maybe the quantified self movement. I use the health tracker a little bit on my app, maybe some fitness apps, but tracking everything, that sounds a bit too good to be true. <laughs> and in practice, it probably is, right? But um, I was finding myself. Uh, interested in doing some quantification of my life, uh, as I think sure. probably occurs to a lot of us these days. Um, knowing that data is a route to discovery and not really having the tools at hand to collect, to collect that data in a, in a helpful way. So I went hunting around, this was in 2015, I guess late 2015. I went hunting around for an app thinking, okay, easy. There's got to be something out there for me to to do some data tracking. And of course I found tons of apps that wanted to help me collect data, uh, but they were very focused on specific areas, right? So it was like track your food or track your fitness or specifically track weight training, not even all fitness, right? And so if I had some uh, concerns that, that spanned categories, uh, what was I going to do? You know, it was going to be difficult to get my data out of those apps because PS, especially then, they did not want you to get your data out of them. And then I would have to do this sort of like mashup analysis on my own anyway. So I figured, okay, I'll just, you know, I'll just use a spreadsheet, a Google sheet on my phone. Little did I know how annoying it would be to do that. <laughs> like if you're out in the world, out to eat, and you want to make sure you take a note that you ate an avocado while you were out to eat, it's extremely annoying to open up your phone and find Google Sheets and find the right sheet and find the right row and put it in edit mode. I was like, this is completely insane. So I thought, okay, I can, I can make a better UI than this for sure. And then I'll just hook it up to Google Sheets. I don't care, you know? And so I kind of made this really lightweight uh, data tracker to start and was using it in front of the person who ended up becoming one of my co-founders. And he was like, what is that? And I was like, mm, you know, I just wanted to do some tracking and Really, what I wanted was one a giant button I could push when something happened, right? I didn't want a spreadsheet. I just wanted a button. Uh, he was like, "That's really cool. We should make something out of that." So we you know, that was version one. Version two was built on Firebase. And once we started to really explore potential use cases, we realized that um, you know data privacy was going to be really important for this. We felt like, and the you know the winds were changing then. The, that was right amidst the Cambridge Analytica scandal and. Um, a bunch of other sort of things were shifting in the landscape. And we thought, 
you know, we need to make the, we need to up the privacy game on this if we're going to actually get anybody to use it for anything important. And so privacy kind of worked itself in uh, at that point. I love that. I think that's a great place where so many of us have questions that we maybe can't articulate, uh, but we just have this feeling that, you know, our privacy has been the last on large corporations lists for quite some time now. So how do you view what Tally Lab is doing and how do you explain, you know, your philosophy on privacy as you build this? It is a really amorphous, very quickly shifting topic right now. And so it really depends on the context of the conversation, how I talk about it or whether I talk about it at all, to be honest, because right. uh, when it comes down to it, people want to use an application for what it's going to do to help them solve a problem. And, and privacy is, for a lot of consumers, somewhat of an afterthought. Corporations have done a really good job, intentional or not, of making it feel so overwhelming and the prospect of getting your own you know, data and your data privacy under control so difficult that like, it's hard to kind of keep in your mind for more than <laughs> one minute before your brain just glazes over. Like That just seems really annoying. The way I usually talk about it is that like, going forward, this is just going to get more and more important. And, and there's, there's sort of several aspects of this where it's like, for us anyway, we didn't want to have to cross that bridge later. We didn't want to have to retrofit privacy later if it did become important. So if we built it in at the outset, then we would we kind of just get to cross that off the list and we don't have to think about, you know, retrofitting it or or actually having a bunch of user data that we then have to figure out what to do with. Um, that's a real um, compliance liability actually to just having Definitely. the user's data in an unencrypted form. So we kind of just decided to make that decision at the outset. And then you know, it can be a selling point and it doesn't have to be a selling point. I kind of describe it as sort of icing on a cake. It isn't the cake, um, but it definitely, if, if, if you have a given user or business looking to use some technology and privacy is built into one of them and not into the other, it's a, you know, it's a competitive advantage, but it isn't the substance of the app, right? So yeah, that's kind of how we talk about it. But in our case, uh, the way we went about baking privacy in actually ended up being a real source of technical innovation for us as well. And so we kind of end up, I want to talk about that with people and, it, and you can't really talk about data. You can't talk about that, the technical innovation without talking about data privacy. And frequently it's, it's a little frustrating, but frequently people, I think, walk away from talking to me thinking that we're building a data privacy app or a security app of some kind, which is not true. Um, sure. But it's so, it's so fundamental to what we've built and what we continue to build that it is an important thing to talk about. It's a real, you know, double-edged sword in a way because you don't want to mislead people as to what the purpose of what you're building is, but <laughs> you also want them to understand why it's special and unique. So as you think about the life of the average user of Tally Lab, what are you thinking about and how do you see your uh, platform, your product, your service kind of helping them or, you know, do you see it nudging them in a direction? Do you see it integrating with their life? And if so, how? Yes. And really our, one of our, you know, not so secret agendas with this app is to actually help people be more data literate and more data science literate overall. It, that's kind of a sneaky, a sneaky backdoor reason for building it, which is that the more people start to think about the data flows in their lives and how they might be able to capture them and use them for themselves, it gets them thinking more statistically, which, I mean, in the context of a pandemic, is a really helpful mindset to be able to call, bring to bear, you know? It's, it's a special way of thinking that we aren't typically taught in school and is not, a, is not an intuitive way of thinking about the world, a statistical kind of approach. So that's kind of why we wanted to do it, is that if you can think of something in your life that you know collecting a little bit of data would help you understand better, whether it's like maybe you think you have a food allergy or maybe you think you're deluding yourself about how often you exercise or like whatever it is. Um, knowing that if you collected a little bit of data about it, that you might end up gleaning some insight, that is the sort of kernel that can then really lead a person on a path of discovery of sort of data science generally and how it works. And it really helps you, uh, you know, consume what's going on in the world now. I mean, data really is driving the world in a lot of ways now. And I, I, I worry that, that generally speaking, folks don't have a good understanding of how that works or what it means. So we're kind of, 
you know, our kind of sneaky raison d'etre here is, is um, a sort of general data science education app. But how we see it fitting into people's lives um, in the near term is just, is just how I describe that you, you know, if you are on board enough to understand that collecting some data might help, maybe, maybe it came from your doctor. Your doctor was like, can you track your symptoms for something uh, for a couple of months and then we can decide what's going on. Um, and then you've gone that extra step to maybe start carrying a notebook around or something. You immediately understand how annoying it is. You know, like you don't, it, carrying a notebook around, it's just, it's the data becomes messy immediately because it's very difficult to collect consistently. Right. The main kernel here, as I described with my little story about my, about my big button I want to push, <laughs> is that you want to make it really easy for people to capture what they need to capture as close to in the moment as they can. So that later, once they have been doing that for a month or weeks or days or a month or however long, they, can, they then have a, a, a data set that is worth looking into. Uh, so that's really how we see it fitting into people's lives. But I, I always tell users, you know, a, a lot of people are like, oh, that sounds like a recipe for OCD or it just sounds really boring or tedious. When I tell people that it's not meant uh, for you to use to track every single thing in your life forever, because yes, that's obnoxious and not, <laughs> not a utopia <laughs> that I can imagine. But really just it's about kind of setting up little studies. Like you have a hypothesis about, you know, maybe you think you're allergic to avocados. Um, so collect a little data and see if you can figure out the answer. And then once you figure out the answer, stop collecting data. You don't need to keep doing that. Find something else you want to you wanna, you wanna keep track of. So it isn't really right. meant to be necessarily a lifelong, you know, one track habit, but more as a sort of experiment space as an individual. Yeah, and I think that's really exciting because experiments with an N of one are typically yes. impossible or really difficult. Yes. And you need a, an outside team, an outside observer. And this is the, uh, the starting point of that, right? Right, so exactly. Could you maybe uh, give us an example of an experiment that someone might want to run and, you know, like the start date, the end date, and uh, what might someone do here? Sure. One case study I often talk about is, from, is an actual user who did an actual study. Um, they had read, they have, they have trouble sleeping and they don't have typical insomnia in the sense that they have a hard time falling asleep. They have a hard time staying asleep. So they fall asleep just fine, but like getting more than three or four hours of sleep in a row are, is really difficult. And they've tried everything to improve their sleep quality and duration and it just, nothing seems to help. And they had read, you know, some obscure, you know, couple of studies about vitamin B and its effect on sleep and how it might actually, even though it is kind of activating for a lot of people, it actually might help this group of people who have a hard time staying asleep. They began, they did this in like a fantastically scientific way, which I am very appreciative of. But they basically, you know, tracked their sleep for a few months um, just by itself. No intervention. Just what's the baseline of sleep? How many hours? And then they came up with their own quality rating of zero to 10, zero being worst night of sleep ever and 10 being best night of sleep ever. Um, they did that for a couple of months and then they started taking vitamin B before sleep and they, they noted when they took it, you know, maybe they missed a night or something. So that was in there as well. And they did that for three months and then, and then didn't feel like it was helping, but decided that they would cut it off for a little while, do more data collection and then see, and then analyze. And it turned out that it had negligible and perhaps negative effects on their sleep. Uh, the tread line suggests that it was actually making their sleep worse. Um, and that, that seems kind of like, you know, womp, womp, what a bummer of a result. But I think it's an important lesson about science, which is that like, okay, well, we ruled that out. You know, that's, that's still useful to know. Um, and they really, you know, they took great notes and they were very helpful in sharing that data with me because, you know, as we discussed, I can't see their data. Um, so that's a great example of, of how it played out. Um, there have been other more positive examples as well, but I really love that one because it was like, they really set this up in a very sort of traditional kind of scientific way. And this person isn't a scientist, so I was very, very impressed by it. Sure. Yeah. I think it's so tempting for us to change many variables at once. Yes. And that example is a great right. reminder of just relax and just, you know, try to just test one thing as, or as few variables as possible at a time. Right. So how are you and your co-founder, Mark, thinking about, you know, building the product and the industry as a whole? What are you watching right now? And, you know, take me into some of like the discussions that you have 
on a daily basis when you're both energized, you know, you're talking about things you're passionate about. What's a conversation between the two of you like? So I think what we're most excited about, frankly, is really the our approach more than our particular implementation so far. So we're really excited about um, creating uh, specific applications of this. I think one of the one of the big lessons so far has been that just an, a really open ended interface where you can track anything is a little bit overwhelming to people, and so having having versions of the app that are more focused and kind of out of the box work well for specific, you know, case studies is probably a better way to go. And furthermore, um, that, that really has teed us up to then help other businesses who want to create tracking apps to do that um, and to do it in a way that keeps privacy at the core. So that's really kind of what, what we're most excited about is sort of seeding, seeding the space. And I mean seeding like S-E-E-D, not relinquishing, but seeding the space right. like you would seed a forest. <laughs> with privacy first data tracking but you know where both data science and user privacy are both extremely important we're not we're not letting either one of those come to the come too much to the fore right and uh you know we've had some great conversations with um potential partners we also have um an app that is now in sort of like a unannounced open beta i would say it's we're, we're doing the announce announcing this week so it's very exciting but um we're implementing a tally lab for a specific use case. So in the case of the, the app that's launching this week, it's a um, remote education log for parents, specifically parents of kids who are in special ed. That group has really struggled in lockdown with their kids home from school because they, they need to be able to track what their kids have been doing so that they can report to their you know, school administration team what's going on and they can make a better plan for that kid over time because th these are sort of kids who are on their own special tracks, you know, right. and having them at home has been really tough. And so, uh, you know, being able to create a tally lab basically for them that is specific to tracking the educational activities of, of special needs kids was just such a great slam dunk for the moment. And it really builds in data privacy in a way that, you know, it's, it's critical for them that that be built into the app. Um, so those are the things that are really exciting to us. It's sort of like, let's take what we've learned making this general purpose app and what we've learned from the, the users we've had of that and fold it into these specific implementations that can help different sectors. Um, that's really kind of the core, the core motivator for us at the moment. Very cool. And when you're thinking about the data science space, are there or statistics broadly, mm -hmm. what are a couple examples or stories you like to tell people to you know, start that education? Or have you found any examples that inspire people to learn more on their own about the space? Oh man, they're all over the place. It really depends on who I'm talking to. But for myself, um, the, the kind of the stories that really resonate for me are kind of like, you know, the, the data set coming out of Flint, Michigan around their um, contaminated water source, like that's a kind of confluence of, you know, policy, government policy, and sort of, of citizen science that has like real impact on real, you know, families and kids' lives. Um, and having a group of people who are, who are data science literate to, uh, enough to understand what are the sort of epidemiological consequences of lead poisoning at a citywide scale, and how can they as citizens contribute to that data set so that people can understand it better and they can make a better case for themselves. Like that is a really um, compelling narrative for me. But I really, I do think that for a lot of people, the most compelling possibility here is this kind of N of one idea or an N of very little. I think we're starting to, to get the sense that there are these broad trends, especially in health. Let's take that as an example. Um, you know, like broad epidemiological trends for things like heart disease, right? But that it's very hard to translate that for an individual. How does that relate to me as a person who may have heart disease, heart disease or, or who may not, right? And I think part of what's really compelling about data science as a field and about the sort of leaps that are being made in that area right now for individuals who are not necessarily data scientists is the fruits of that might be able might be able to be applicable for them in a in a way more tailored way more specific way and i i think people are used to thinking about that with regard to like genetic research around like specific genes and how this drug might interact with this set of genes 
But I think people are starting to realize that they're like walking through life, their lives creating this huge data set of their own life. And it would be really helpful if they could leverage that, even in very small ways, you know, for their own well-being. We now have the tools. We just, it's like they're too disparate, they're spread out, and they have not been constructed with this use case in mind. And so they're not HIPAA compliant by default, et cetera. So I think, you know, getting getting folks to sort of think about their own lives. And I, I really do this as almost like a meditation. I say to them, okay, clear your mind. Think of something in your life that you can't, that, you know, specifically probably a health problem that you just, you know, is an issue. And you know, if you could like nail it, if you could narrow it down in a couple of ways, you could probably solve it pretty easily. Now imagine, like, think to yourself, why haven't you done that? You know, what, and it's because you're not a scientist or you're not a person with technical skills, right? And you wouldn't know where to begin. But all these tools are here now and the UIs are great. And we just have to get them into people's hands and get them using them. And it's a, it's a really positive feedback loop once you do that because people see the value and immediately want to understand it better. Right. And I imagine too, so many of the times where we feel like we are an N of one running an experiment there are other people out there that are running something very similar, or there might even be dozens or hundreds or thousands. The search costs right now seem to be prohibitive from finding those other individuals. Do you foresee this coming down in the future? Because in my mind, that's where the, uh, the revolution here that's brewing will take off. Once those search costs drop and people realize, wait a minute, I'm not alone. There are many other people who are struggling and running the same experiment yes, right now. Right. How do we get to a place where those search costs fall? Uh, if you've got the answer, I would love to know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, that is exactly that is exactly the struggle here, the, the major hurdle. And it's been on our minds since the start. And we have constructed Tally Lab in a way where, um, you know, down the line, we hope to allow a kind of opting, opting in of, da of data sharing, anonymous data sharing into these pools. And it's, it's tricky, right? Because, because we let users set up their own trackers in their own ways, um, in order to contribute to a study that involves lots of folks, we would have to sort of enforce a structure on that data, which, you know, it might be a bummer to some people, but I think the benefit would really outweigh that, that drawback. And oh, we, for sure. yeah. we really, we want to make that available, like inside the app, just like, Hey, you know, Along the lines, I don't know if you're if you're on 23andMe or these other um, you know DNA sort of sequencing sites or platforms, but they do a lot of this work as well, and it would be great to do it from this angle, from the data collection angle. But it's basically like, do you have this problem? Great, opt into this and share your data with us. You know, anonymous, of course, and uh, we can run. You know, if we have a huge data set on something, you know, like a lifestyle intervention for type 2 diabetes, that could affect, you know, millions of lives really positively. And maybe it'll end up being something small, right? And that's, that's the stuff that really like keeps me up at night is just like, keeps me motivated waking up in the morning and working on this. It's just that like, there may be very easy interventions out there that could help loads of people that we just can't see because we haven't been able to do these kinds of studies. So yeah, that is definitely, you know, and that's, that is a, that's a community building exercise, right? So you got to get people on the platform, um, but it could attract those folks. And there are, there are uh, siloed communities doing this, right? So you can get an app of folks who have like, say, cystic fibrosis, right? And, um, you know, track your symptoms and the drugs that you're on or not on inside of this app. And it, it you know, there's a, there's a message board for other folks suffering from this, but imagine it's not too difficult to imagine, right? That I'm a person with cystic fibrosis, but maybe I also have type two diabetes, or I also have some other confounding factors. And wouldn't it be nice if that were in one place instead of having to be this like piecemeal patchwork of various apps and websites, Reddit threads, and you know, like, wouldn't it be great if we had a single sort of repository and it was an easy thing to do? So that's, that's the dream, but it is obviously, it is a, it's a long climb from where we're at. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a long climb until it's not, or it's a long climb until some type of breakthrough makes it easy to identify these communities. And are there any examples from history or other uh, moments and, you know, different technological revolutions that you are particularly inspired by? Uh, I'm curious to know, like, how'd you get into this work and what is uh, keeping you motivated? A very long time ago, I started making websites back when 
Uh, you could call yourself a quote webmaster and basically do all of the things, <laughs> you know. And what I loved about it, you off the bat, well, I just I love the internet. I know it's like a cheesy thing to say, and the internet is a fraught place these days. But I still love it, and I still believe in its ability to bring people together. And that that was what was immediately extremely exciting about it to me is that I was, you know, as a teenager able to just talk to people from all over the world and find things we had in common and sort of build relationships out of those things. And that was really exciting to me. And it was exciting to be able to contribute to the tech, making that possible, like pretty immediately. I mean, that's, it blows my mind just to think about like that, you know, I could just sort of do a couple of searches and learn how to code JavaScript. And then I was building web apps, like what? That is nuts. Anyway, <laughs> I still find that very, very exciting. Um, but the, the way I got to this particular idea and why I, was, I found it compelling was really the sort of big data uh, revolution that, that began at the beginning of the 2010s. I mean, you know, truthfully, it began, you know, at the beginning of the aughts um, with, with Google and the way that they were thinking about data, right? But it took a while for the rest of us to get wise. Um, and I was working for another startup. Um, this was in 2014, 2015. And um, it was a big data startup and it was my first time as a, you know, I have a user experience background professionally and it was my first time trying to build an interface that made sense out of loads of data out of like statistical analysis of that data to regular non-technical people. And it was an extremely compelling task to me. It was like, it's important that more people understand this and it's important that we figure this out, right? But uh, it was also increasingly clear that like with great power comes great responsibility, right? The, the company I was working for in particular did not take great care with end user data or getting their sort of opt-in permission for us to analyze it. And it's clear that a lot of folks just were unaware that this was going on and still are, frankly. A lot of people just don't quite get how much of their data is out there and how much of it's being you know, amalgamated into a single profile that can be leveraged in various ways. Like true, it's mostly being leveraged for advertising, which may or may not upset you, but the potential there is for both a lot of great insight and a lot of danger, right? And so doing that work really gave me a, a glimpse of the power and the potential and the pitfalls of, of this kind of, you know, big data landscape. And it made me want to democratize that. Genuinely, it sounds a little cheesy, and maybe it is, but I, I really felt like individuals should be able to leverage this. If, I, if there's a bunch of data out there that I've been just leaving as a trail behind, of, behind me of breadcrumbs throughout my digital life, shouldn't I own that or at least be able to do some analysis or have others help me analyze it for something that might be interesting about me or about the world? And the fact that it's still, you know, it's 2020 and it's still really, really difficult to, for people to do that. Um, is a real shame to me. And, and frankly, I view it as like a personal failing. You know, like I, this isn't something that other people did. To me, it's something that I contributed to as a technologist. Um, but it's, it's still, uh, I still think the potential for it can be extremely positive. And that's really what continues to drive me. And I know like <laughs> I will probably come across like some kind of Pollyanna to a lot of folks, but it's not from a lack of exposure, it's actually from deep exposure over the course of my entire professional life and seeing how powerful it can be that I really want to make it ethical. You know, I want to make it ethical and I want to make it useful for people. I don't think there's anything about it that sounds Pollyannish or, you know, utopian. It's really just a matter of people valuing their choices, you know, and just really taking a step back and saying like, this is important. Like my next choices are important and being more conscious of them. This is, I think, the, uh, the spark of a completely new way of individuals and groups interfacing and, you know, appropriately valuing themselves. It's almost going to take like a psychological revolution to get there where different people are take a step back and say, uh, I'm unique. And there I'm also, there's also all these ways that I am similar to these, these groups of people. And so many people right now, you know, feel isolated and obviously the quarantine and with different things going on, social unrest and, and things like that. Um, but if we look at history, right, like after every plague, there's typically some turmoil, but then there's a renaissance and the data area is 
this place where we're all using these tools and it's a call to action to say like, your choices are valuable. You can look back at the trail of your life and if other people can look back, why can't you? So when you're getting you know, your information about the industry, when you're thinking about the future, uh, are there any favorite spots, resources, books, podcasts? Uh, where do you kind of get the future from? I cannot speak highly enough of the MIT Technology Review. I know it's fairly mainstream, but it's they are doing great work and they're thinking very deeply and critically about the entire landscape um, as it evolves. And I just continue to be really impressed with the work that they do. It's tough. There's so much, because it's such a hot space tech, right? It's like there's so much flim flam out there in addition to the really good reporting. And it's hard to kind of piece out like which is which. But there's a great, as far as sort of data and data surveillance and um, the intersection of that with, you know, what I would call like behavior hacking, the sort of intersection of those forces, there is a great podcast called Your Undivided Attention. Because they're really looking at the kind of the ethical issues, not just around sort of tracking people, but also around AI and machine learning. And, and the, you know, what, what strikes really at my heart as a user experience design person is the ways that we have kind of weaponized our own cognitive habits against ourselves um, by kind of turning the entire internet into like a, basically like a, a gambling, like a casino floor the ways that we can use those, these, these tools are neutral, right? So we can use these same tools to actually encourage human flourishing, but so far we've just encouraged consumer behavior, more or less, exclusively. And so it really branches quickly into, into many different areas of our society and, and how they intersect. Um, but it's a great podcast if you are, as a person, just starting to think about these things and want to think about them more deeply. Um, can't, can't recommend that highly enough. Access and Opportunity with Carla Harris, who works at Morgan Stanley. She is a vice chairman. And she basically interviews uh, underrepresented founders of companies that subsequently went on to become huge, right? So people of color, women. And also on the VC side, she interviews um, a bunch of venture capitalists who are trying to sort of change the way investment in startups is allocated. Um, along those lines. And she, as a, as a sort of insider industry veteran, just has a fantastic uh, sort of perspective on this. And she did a huge report from Morgan Stanley a few years ago about how um, underrepresented founders represent a billion dollar investment opportunity that people are just leaving on the table out of institutional bias, basically. Um, but this podcast is great because it's just interviews with founders and, um, you know, their stories and, and what, they, what they struggled with and what they perceive to be the sort of like keys to their success. And it's, it's a really great frame. Um, and also on, the, on that tip, there was a great book that I read about a year ago, I think maybe more, called Lean Out, you know, which was sort of a response to Lean In. And it was a bunch of kind of first person tales of um, working in startups in Silicon Valley um, and just sort of how it fries you. I found that to be a really helpful um, antidote to a lot of the, you know, myth making. There's a lot of myth making in this, in this space. And while it's really inspiring on the one hand, the myth making, it also, I think if you're in the middle of it, you're in the slog, you're trying to build a company, uh, it can be really dispiriting. So it's, it's great to get a kind of diversity of voices around that stuff. You know, what we're doing technologically is a little bit uh, sort of adjacent um, to blockchain technology, um, since what we're building is peer-to-peer is -peer under the hood. Um, and so I do dabble, you know, I try to keep, keep up with what's going on in that space since there is a lot that, that dovetails. But I haven't, you know, it's so focused on coin digital currency, that it's, it's a little bit difficult to get into that space. It's changing slowly. I've noticed that there's a lot more sort of broader conversation and, and about other novel uses of blockchain, right? So uh, like the civil coin sort of experiment. I don't know if you remember that from a couple of years ago, but um, of like, how can we use, here's some interesting technology that can really democratize a lot of things that are in bad need of democratization. <laughs> How can we leverage them? Uh, so I do try to keep an eye on that space, but there's nothing, there's no particular resource that I go to for that. Very cool. And when it comes to your physical location, so 
we are based in Silicon Valley right now, but we're looking elsewhere like so many companies and folks are the, there are these emerging tech hubs and, you know, Boston has been on uh, many people's radar mm -hmm. for biotech and they yep. think of it in the, you know, a certain way. Yep. How do you view that area and uh, why'd you choose that location to get started? Because I happen to live here. Awesome reason. So there's a lot of um, medical device technology and pharma coming out of Boston, which is super interesting. And it, it gives it this kind of um, scientific bent that I really like. And given that we're doing a, a sort of data science thing, it's, it's a helpful space to be. That said, it is not at all consumer focused in the way that Silicon Valley is. And so to the extent that we have a consumer facing product, you know, which is sort of, you know, at this point, 50% of our business, let's say, it's a tough place to be because folks here don't really care about <laughs> consumer tech <laughs> in the same way. I mean, iRobot is here, right? So there are, there are some niches, but it's, it's definitely a, a biotech and then a like hard tech, what I would say like, you know, hardware tech kind of place. Um, so building a software as a service company with a consumer focus is really, it's, it's difficult. I wouldn't say it's the best place for that yet. I'm very curious to see how the pandemic upends these niche, uh, you know, locate, like where location has, to the extent that location has become less important, right? Um, I wonder whether we will see, you know, new like companies being less dependent on the ecosystem from which they arise. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of hopeful in that regard. I mean, you know, you can't find a place in America with a greater concentration of extremely educated smart people than you find in the boston metro area i mean it's intense the conversations you overhear on the street or the bus here are just <laughs> bonkers like people talking about you know quantum mechanics or just like anything right the mit media lab is a fantastic resource that is really a, a hub of, of technical innovation and creativity here and it's it's fantastic but when it comes to um building companies out of this stuff it, we just don't, we don't hold a candle to Silicon Valley and it's, it's a, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, but a main, a main aspect is just that that's where the money is, right? And if you want investment and you want to grow fast, there's no place in America to do that, you know, more successfully than in Silicon Valley. And that's very true. New York is, is making a, is, you know, I've, we've, we've done a lot of stuff in New York. We go to New York a lot or did before the lockdown. Um, there are a lot of investors there. There's a lot of interesting tech going on there, but it still is just, you know, it's, it just all pales in comparison to what's going on in Silicon Valley. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the pandemic uh, maybe upends that somewhat, because I do feel like there's a lot of really interesting stuff, ha stuff happening all over the world, all over the U.S. for sure, right? Um, it's just it, Silicon Valley is hoarding all the oxygen <laughs> still, right? <laughs> They've got the capital. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, Boston, yeah. If you are building a biotech company or you know a hardware company of some kind, this is a great place to start it. Um, but SaaS, hmm, especially consumer SaaS, not so much. Jordan, thank you so much for sharing with us and joining us today. This has been an awesome conversation. Yeah. If there's anything uh, left that you want to leave our audience with or a final thought, a final question that you wish you were asked more, uh, feel free to take the stage. Oh, man. Well, I didn't get to talk about our underlying tech that much. And I I do try to go out of my way to talk about how a sort of top-down cloud computing uh, framework, which is what has made the internet as successful as it's been so far, was a very necessary step. It's really outdated now, and I, I'm really excited. I kind of touched on this a little bit with the with the blockchain comment, but... What we are really excited about is sort of is democratizing data science, but also democratizing peer-to-peer -peer tech, which is, is going to really change the landscape, I think, of the internet and therefore of, you know, sort of connected technology in the next 10 years. And I want your listeners to go check out what's going on in that space right now, because it's really exciting. Awesome. Jordan, thanks for sharing with us and best of luck as you continue to grow Tally Lab. Yeah, you and Mark are doing great work and it was super cool to talk to you today. Yeah, it was great chatting with you. Thanks for the chance to do it. And to everyone listening, we'll see you next time.
I'm Sophia Bush, and you've been listening to Hidden in Plain Sight from Mission.org. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Splunk, the Data to Everything platform. In today's data-driven world, every company, big or small, new or old, is sitting on terabytes of unused, untapped, and unknown data. Splunk helps turn all that data into action. Using cutting-edge AI and machine learning, Splunk delivers real-time predictive insights that will help you on your mission to change the world. With solutions for IT, security, Internet of Things, and business operations, Splunk empowers people to make faster, better decisions and take action to get things done. It's time for our data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen.